Maybe 10 minutes in here. Do you need some energy break right now? Okay. If everyone's okay, we keep going. I'm going to give you some instructions. Also, anyone need to be heard before Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to tell you about the principles of the law governing this key. I'm required to accept my instructions as the law. You should consider these instructions as a whole and do not pick out any particular instruction and place undue emphasis upon it. Any ideas you have about what the law is or what the law should be, um, or any statements by the attorneys as to what the law may be, must be disregarded by you if they conflict with my charges. I sit here as the judge of the law. As part of this responsibility, I have made various rulings and statements throughout this trial. Do not read these rulings and statements as clues about how I think the case should be decided. They are not. They are based solely on my understanding of the law and the rules of evidence, and they do not reflect any opinions of mine about the merits of this case. Even if they did, you should disregard them because it is your role to decide this case, not mine. The lawyers are here as advocates for their clients. In their opening statements and in their summations, they can give you their views of the evidence and their arguments in favor of their clients' positions. While you may consider their comments, nothing that the attorneys say is evidence, and their comments are not binding upon you. You sit here as judges of the facts. You alone have the responsibility of deciding the factual issues in this case. It is your recollection and evaluation of the evidence that controls. If the attorneys or I say anything about the facts in this case that disagrees with your recollection of the evidence, it is your recollection that you should rely on. Your decision in this case must be based solely on the evidence presented and my instructions on the law. The evidence in this case consists of the testimony that you've heard from witnesses, the exhibits that have been marked into evidence, the deposition testimony and answers to interrogatories that were uh, read into the record. This matter stems from a fire-related incident that occurred on August 17, 2017. The plaintiffs who are bringing this action leased commercial property on Route 130 in Bordentown. Plaintiffs allege that the defendant, Seven Hill Trucking, parked a truck at the subject property on the date of the incident and said truck caught fire, resulting in damages to plaintiff's personal property and loss of lease. Defendant denies responsibility for the happening of the accident, as well as the nature and extent of the damages alleged by the plaintiffs. The burden of proof is on the plaintiffs to establish their claim by a preponderance of the evidence. In other words, if a person makes an allegation, then that person must prove the allegation. In this action, the plaintiffs have the burden of establishing by a preponderance of the evidence <coughs> all of the facts necessary to prove that it was more likely than not that the damages alleged by the plaintiffs were caused by the negligence of the defendant. The phrase preponderance of the evidence means that amount of evidence that causes you to conclude that the allegation is probably true. To prove an allegation by the preponderance of the evidence, a party must convince you that the allegation is more likely true than not true. If the evidence on a particular issue is equally balanced, that issue has not been proven by a preponderance of the evidence. Therefore, the party having the burden of proving that issue has failed with respect to that particular issue. Evidence may be direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is direct proof of fact, such as the testimony of an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence, sometimes called inferences, consists of a chain of circumstances pointing to the evidence of certain facts. Circumstantial evidence is based upon deductions or logical conclusions that you reach from the direct evidence. So let me give you an example of both direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. If a witness testified that he or she observed snow falling last night, that would be an example of direct evidence. If, on the other hand, the witness testified that there was no snow on the ground before going to sleep at night, and then when he or she arose in the morning, the ground was snow covered, you could infer from these facts that it snowed during the night. This would be an example of circumstantial evidence. You may consider both direct and circumstantial evidence in deciding this case. The law permits you to give equal weight to both, but it is for you to decide how much weight to give to any evidence. 
When deciding this case, you are permitted to draw inferences from the evidence. Inferences are deductions from logical conclusions drawn from the evidence. Use logic, your collective common knowledge, and your common sense when determining what inferences can be made from the evidence. You will have to decide which witnesses to believe and which witnesses not to believe. Regardless of whether the witness is a lay person or an expert, although we didn't really have any experts here, you may believe everything the witness said or only part of it or none of it. In deciding what testimony to believe, you may take into consideration the witness's interest in any of the outcome of this case, the accuracy of the witness's recollection, the witness's ability to know what he or she is talking about, the reasonableness of the testimony, the witness's demeanor on the stand, the witness's candor or evasion, the witness's willingness or reluctance to answer, the inherent believability of the testimony, the presence of any inconsistent or contradictory statements. If you believe that any witness deliberately lied to you on any fact significant to your decision in this case, you have the right to reject all of that witness's testimony. However, in your discretion, you may believe some of that testimony and not believe other parts of the testimony. Reference has been made to Omar Uraglu and the defendant's accountant, and that the defendant failed to produce information about them to the plaintiffs. The rule is that where a plaintiff fails to identify or produce a witness, as a witness, a person whom the party would naturally be expected to call to testify, you have a right to infer that had the witness been identified or produced, he would have testified adversely to the interests of that party. The reason for this rule is that where you would normally expect a party to identify or call a person as a witness, and that party, without reasonable explanation, fails to do so, it leaves a natural inference that the non-producing party fears exposure of facts which would be unfavorable to it. Negligence may be defined as a failure to exercise in the given circumstances that degree of care for the safety of others which a person of ordinary prudence would exercise under similar circumstances. It may be the doing of an act which the ordinary prudent person would not have done, or the failure to do that which the ordinary prudent person would have done under the circumstances that existed. In any case in which there is a claim that the defendant is negligent, it must be proven to you that the defendant breached a duty of reasonable care which was an approximate cause of the plaintiff's injuries. Generally, the mere fact that an accident happened with nothing more does not provide proof that the accident was a result of negligence. In a negligence case, the plaintiff must prove that there was some specific negligent act or omission by the defendant which approximately caused the incident. However, in certain circumstances, the very happening of an incident may be an indication of negligence. Thus, the plaintiff may, by providing facts and circumstances, establish negligence by circumstantial evidence. If the instrumentality causing the loss was in the exclusive control of the defendant, and if the circumstances surrounding the happening were of such a nature that in the ordinary course of events the incident would not have occurred, if the entity having control of the instrumentality had used reasonable care under the circumstances, the law permits, but does not require, the jury to infer negligence from the happening of the incident. Plaintiff's voluntary act or neglect contributing to the occurrence prevents the inference from being drawn. However, the mere fact that a plaintiff was present does not defeat the inference. Rather, you must know that the plaintiff's action or negligence was a proximate cause of the occurrence to prevent the inference. For instance, assume someone was walking on the sidewalk under a piano which was being lifted by a crane to go into the upper floor, and assume further that the piano fell onto a pedestrian. The falling piano would be an indication of negligence, since pianos do not usually fall from the sky without someone being negligent. The mere fact that the pedestrian was present is not a voluntary act or neglect. In summary, if you find, by the greater weight of the evidence, that at the time of the incident, the defendant had exclusive control of the instrumentality causing the occurrence, 
that the circumstances were such that in the ordinary course of events, the incident would not have occurred if the defendant had exercised reasonable care, and plaintiff's voluntary act of negligence did not contribute to the occurrence, then you may infer that the defendant was negligent. As to the requirement of defendant having exclusive control, this implies that the control was of such type that the probabilities that the negligent act was caused by someone else is so remote that it is fair to permit an inference of negligence by the defendant. If you infer that the defendant was negligent, then the plaintiffs need not point out any specific conduct or inaction by the defendant that was a breach of its duty of reasonable care. This inference was drawn even if plaintiffs introduced some evidence of defendant's specific negligence. If you do infer that the defendant was negligent, then you should consider the defendant's explanation of the accident. If the explanation causes you to believe that it is no longer reasonable to infer that the defendant was negligent, then the defendant is entitled to your verdict. But if giving fair weight to all the worthwhile evidence, you decide that it is more likely than not that the defendant was negligent, then your verdict should be for the plaintiff. If you find that the defendant was negligent, you must find that the defendant's negligence was a proximate cause of the incident before you can find that the defendant was responsible for the plaintiff's claimed losses. It is the duty of plaintiffs to establish, by preponderance of the evidence, that the negligence of the defendant was a proximate cause of the incident and of the losses alleged to have resulted from the defendant's negligence. The basic question for you to resolve is whether plaintiff's losses are so connected with the negligent actions or inactions of the defendant that you decide it is reasonable, in accordance with the instructions that I give you, that the defendant should be held wholly or partially responsible for the losses. By proximate cause, I refer to a cause that in a natural and continuous sequence produces the incident and resulting losses, and without which the resulting incident or losses would not have occurred. A person who is negligent is held responsible for any incident or losses that result in the ordinary course of events from the defendant's negligence. This means that you must find that the resulting incident or losses to plaintiffs would not have occurred but for the negligent conduct of the defendant. If you find that but for the defendant's negligence, the incident or losses would not have occurred, then you should find that the defendant was a proximate cause of the plaintiff's losses. I am now going to instruct you on the law governing damages in the event you decide liability in favor of the plaintiffs. The fact that I instruct you on damages should not be considered as suggesting any views of mine about which party is entitled to prevail in this case. Instructions on damages are given for your guidance in the event that you find that plaintiffs are entitled to a verdict. I am required to provide instructions on damages in all cases in which the trial includes a claim for damages. If you ultimately find that the plaintiff's personal property was damaged as a result of the defendant's negligence, plaintiffs would be entitled to your verdict. Plaintiffs would be entitled to money damages from the defendant for the loss suffered. The measure of damages for such loss is the difference between the market value of the personal property before and the market value after the damage occurred. If the personal property has no market value in its damaged condition, the measure of damages is the difference between the market value of the personal property before the damage occurred and its salvage value in its damaged condition. If the personal property is not substantially damaged and it can be repaired at cost less than the difference between its market value before and its market value after the damage occurred, the plaintiff's damages would be limited to the cost of repairs. In determining the amount of money, if any, to be awarded to the plaintiffs for the damages to their personal property, you may consider but are not bound by the testimony of the plaintiffs as to their opinion of the value of the property before and after it was damaged. Your oath as jurors requires you to decide this case fairly and impartially without sympathy, passion, bias, or prejudice. You are to decide this case based solely upon the evidence that you find believable and in accordance with the rules of law that I've given you. Sympathy is an emotion which is normal for human beings and no one can be critical of human feelings some degree of sympathy in this matter. 
However, that sympathy must play no part in your thinking and the decision you reach in the jury room. Similarly, your decision must not be based upon any bias or prejudice which might have developed during the trial for or against any party. Your duty is to decide this case impartially and a decision based on sympathy, passion, bias, or prejudice would violate that duty. You are not advocates for either party. You are judges of the facts. Remember the instructions that I gave you at the opening of this case that you must not conduct any investigation or research of any nature whatsoever relating to this case. You must not use the internet or any other resource or any purpose at all relating to this case. You must not even look up the meaning of the word in a dictionary. You are to consider only the evidence presented to you in this courtroom and the instructions as to the law as I've given them. As I indicated in my preliminary instructions to you, if I determine that any one of you has violated this rule, it may result in a mistrial or in a penalty being imposed on the person who violated the rule or fails to advise the court if another member of the jury has violated this rule. Your sole interest as jurors is to determine the truth from the evidence that has been presented to you here in this courtroom in this case. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view to reaching an agreement, if you can do so without compromising your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with the other jurors. There are now eight of you in the jury box. All eight of you will make up the jury which will deliberate and decide this case. Because this is a civil case, any verdict of 7 to 1 or 8 to 0 is a legal verdict. Therefore, it is not necessary that all eight jurors agree on each question. An agreement of any seven jurors is sufficient. All eight jurors must deliberate fully and fairly on each and every question, and all eight jurors must determine and vote on each question. It is not necessary that the same, that the seven, same seven jurors uh, agree upon the answers to all questions. Whenever at least seven jurors have agreed to any answer, that question has been decided, and you may move on to consider the remaining questions in the case if it is appropriate to do so. All eight jurors must fully participate in deliberating on the remaining questions. A juror who has been outvoted on any question shall continue to deliberate with the other jurors fairly, impartially, honestly, and conscientiously to decide the remaining questions. Each juror must consider each question with an open mind. When at least seven of you have agreed upon a verdict, you can knock on the jury room door, indicate to the attendant that you've reached a verdict, and say nothing more. The attendant will escort you back to the jury box so that the court may receive your verdict. So I have prepared a jury verdict sheet, uh, which should make your task simpler in deciding this case. I will be sending the jury verdict sheet back uh, with you. The sheet has questions that you must consider and answer within the framework of the instructions that I've given you. So I'll just go over the, the questions with you. The first one asks, have the plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that defendant Seven Hill Trucking LLC was negligent and that defendant's negligence was a proximate cause of the incident on August 17, 2017? And you see there is a, uh, an area there where they can either mark yes or no, or one or the other, and then you can put your vote tally. And that vote tally will either be 8 to 0 or 7 to 1. It then instructs you, if your answer to question number one is no, you cease deliberations and inform the court you have reached a verdict. If your answer is yes, proceed to question number two. Question number two says, have the plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of evidence that they sustained damages approximately caused by the incident of August 17, 2017? Again, there's a place you can either mark yes or no, and then put your vote tally, 8 to 0 or 7 to 1. The instruction thereafter reads, if your answer to question number 2 is no, cease deliberations and inform the court if you have reached a verdict. If you answer the above question yes, proceed to question number 3. Question number 3 asks, what amount of money would fairly and reasonably compensate plaintiffs for the town truck and auto, Recepts the Valley, Oregon, Ostevere, and Pugliel, Pugliel, I apologize for mispronouncing any of these things, um, for the damages proven to be approximately caused by this incident. You see there, uh, on this one, there's a blank with a dollar sign in front of it that can be filled in, and then below that, once again, there's an area for the vote tally of either 8 to 0 or 7 to 1. The 
Final instruction says cease deliberations and inform the court when you reach your verdict. If during your deliberations you wish to communicate with the court or would you would like me to repeat any part of the jury instructions, please write your request for a uh, question on a piece of paper and give that note to the attendant. I will respond to you as quickly as I can by having you back in the courtroom and back on the record. I should caution you, however, that at no point until you've reached your final verdict should you indicate to the attendant or to anyone else what your vote has been on any question that's been before you. That is a matter that only members of the jury should know until you've reached a verdict in the case. Alright, so, let me take this uh, time. I do want to thank everyone again. I know it's, it's been a lengthy week for everybody. We realize that this case has interfered with your daily lives and probably caused you some inconvenience. Uh, as I previously mentioned before, our judicial system certainly could not function without people like you who are willing to give up your time and serve uh, as us reviewers. It's a job that has to be done in order for uh, people to be able to resolve their differences by jury trial. So we are extremely grateful for the time uh, that you've spent here with us. Council, does anyone have anything needs to be heard before we? Okay. So I'm going to designate the poor person. The poor person is the first juror uh, seated in. Uh, seat number one, the fourth person is charged with ensuring that each juror deliberates, writes any questions the jury may have for the court, and marks the verdict sheet uh, and the vote on the jury question sheet. When the jury returns to the courtroom, the fourth person will report the verdict to the court by giving the vote and answering each of the questions on the jury verdict sheet as they are read uh, by the court clerk. So with that, Joanna, if you could swear our jury attendant, please. Oh. oh, sorry. Um, no, you need to tell me. I'm going to have a discard. Sorry about that. Do you swear or affirm that you will do your best to keep every person sworn on this jury together in a private place, and that you will not allow any person to speak to them, nor speak to them yourself, except by order of the court, and except to ask them if they agree on the verdict until they are so agreed? That's fine. Okay. okay. Now, before I send you to deliberate, I have a very important question. And that's about lunch. So, um, would the jurors like to break for lunch, or did you want to work for lunch? Is that another preference? Or any other? So you started off with a hard question. It's about lunch. Okay. okay. So, um, if, uh, we'll let you work for lunch. Uh, if anyone needs to go and grab lunch or bring it back or whatever, the only thing that I ask is that you don't deliberate until all eight of you are in the room together so that you can all deliberate together, okay? So um, just wait until everyone's back with their lunches and whatever, and then you can get started. All right. And then, um, and also let me give you the caveat that I probably will be back for lunch to one third. So even if you can come up with a decision at 1.20 or something, I will be back to you. Um, with that, we will excuse the jury to the, the